Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Nursing Uncharted, the podcast that delves into your nursing nursing specialty and all other nursing specialties. Um, thank you so much for listening today. Welcome. If you this is your first podcast with us that you've listened to, um, and if you are an avid listener, I appreciate you so much. Um, this episode is sponsored by Amen Passport. Amen Passport is an app that Amen has created that helps you find, book, and manage assignments all from your phone. Um, puts you in the fast track to your ne- next travel assignment. So if you're in the market for a travel assignment, be sure to check that out. I am super excited to get into today's episode. Before we get started, we are going to TravCon. TravCon is the one and only travel nurse conference, and it's September 17th to 20th at the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas. And AMN has a booth, and they're going to be giving away prizes the whole time. I'll be there, and I would love to meet you guys, so let's meet up. You can register at TravCon.org to go. And if you're somebody who's like, who has money to go to conferences, you know, by myself. TravCon also has scholarship opportunities that you can look into. So it doesn't hurt to just apply. It's going to be so fun. So I hope to see you there. So today... I have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Stephanie Hutchins. She's the author of Transformation After Trauma and Reclaim Your Life After Trauma. I met her at NurseCon um, because she was speaking about overcoming barriers related to trauma. And as clinicians who have gone through COVID and short staffing, and we've seen a lot over the last three years, we have unprocessed stress in our bodies, a lot of us do, that might stunt us from moving forward in our lives. So I thought that it would be wonderful for our listeners to have her on. Um, but this topic isn't just for clinicians. You know, we just isn't just for us as clinicians. We, we all have different stories and backgrounds and traumas that affect our lives, that impact us. So it's important to figure out how to overcome that. So how do we take the next steps towards transforming our lives so that the trauma doesn't define us but propels us to our highest potential? So Stephanie is a certified life coach, stress management coach, advanced wellness coach, a neuro-linguistics programming practitioner, and a yoga instructor. And she also owns Seratness Life, a company that helps individuals harness the power of post-traumatic growth. So Stephanie, welcome to the show today. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Maggie. I'm really excited to be here today. I'm really excited to have you. These, These conversations really you know, all the warm, fuzzy feelings inside for me, just because I feel like we're really, the conversation that we have, you know, tends to ripple and make a real impact in in our listeners. So I appreciate you coming on. So I really love the meaning behind your name, Seratness Life. And I was just hoping that you would, you know, explain like what it symbolizes and how it ties into your practice. So I was a biology professor for 12 years. And for your listeners that, you know, that aren't familiar with me, I'm actually not a nurse. Mm -hmm. I, but I worked with many nursing students um, when I was teaching anatomy and physiology for many years. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's really exciting to have the opportunity to work with nurses, practicing nurses um, in new ways, like through NurseCon and Mm -hmm. as a NurseCon educator. And, and now on, on, podcast like this. And, and because I was a biology professor, I could not help but tie in my love of science when I was picking my business name. And people (laughs) thought it was a really bad business move when I chose Serotonous Life. They were like, how do you even pronounce it? How do you spell it? Nobody knows this word. (laughs) Like, what were you thinking, <laughs> Stephanie? And so I, I just couldn't help myself. But I was like, I'm a teacher. I need to teach people what this means because it's very significant. Yeah. So I have um, an extensive uh, trauma history starting from a young age. And um, and even though I've experienced a lot of hardship in my life, I've also experienced a tremendous amount of beauty and adventure and just wonderful things. And I truly believe that I would not have experienced the beauty that I have in life without the immense suffering that Mm -hmm. I have. And so when, so that's why, um, you know, with my practice, Rotten's Life, it focuses on tra- post-traumatic growth, this idea of being able to actually grow and improve after 
our trauma and actually can in many ways use our trauma. Mm -hmm. And that's where this, where serotonin comes in because there are serotonin. Um, so certain trees that have serotonin cones on them, uh, like the giant sequoias mm -hmm. out in the West coast of the United States, they're actually the largest trees on earth and humans almost protected them into extinction because what they didn't understand is that because they have serotonin cones, they need significant environmental stress to open those cones. Mm. And the predominant stressor is fire. And see, most people view fire as being devastating, yeah. as that nothing good can come from it. And so conservationists were like, we have to prevent this can come, coming through because it will only cause devastation. Mm. Well, what they didn't understand is that without the fire, see, like the giant sequoias, they have a resin on the outside of these cones and it can't melt off without the fire. And so without mm. fire, new sequoias weren't allowed to be released from the cones. And so eventually, theoretically, serotonous species could go extinct without extreme stressors like fire. And so... I, I, I really, I thought that was such an important concept to tie into my business because reframing, um, you know, changing our perspective on our experiences is, a, is a, an important tool I use in my practice. And, you know, people have, again, this one story that fire is bad, but they don't realize many times there's a whole other way of viewing fire is that it's life-giving, is that new growth can happen because of it. And, and so, and the same is with trauma. Yes, we can look at trauma as being devastating because it is in many ways, but you can also find gifts, no matter how significant the suffering, there are gifts left behind. And so, so again, that's the idea of tying in serotonin is there's always a gift left behind in immense, um, adversity. And sometimes we need that adversity to really grow in experience new dimensions in our life. I love that. I love that perspective that strength can't happen unless we first experience a break or pressure or trauma. And, you know, so, because then only mending can happen in order to evolve into something much stronger than before. And yeah. I think that that's so applicable to us as clinicians. I think that we can become stronger than ever. You know, our traumas and what we've gone through can strengthen us into better clinicians instead of broken, callous clinicians. And, you know, I think that the common perception, the narrative that it's been in the last three years from COVID is that, you know, nurses are are burned out. And it seems like that's our only the only feeling that we can have. You know, it's like nurses get burned out and they leave and you know, I wonder if we're ready to shift that narrative, like, and make room for us to like our jobs again and, and like appreciate our units and understand that we can be, be stronger from everything that, that has happened. Oh, and I, I appreciate you so much for, for, for allowing even this discussion to happen to now to even consider, is it time to think about the gifts that were left behind from COVID. I mean, of course. And again, people think that when I talk about post-traumatic growth and thinking about gifts coming from trauma, that I'm talking about that you must be grateful, you know, and, and you shouldn't have suffered, but it's not that it's that you can't change that you suffered. You can't change the pain, but you can change the story of your pain, the meaning behind your pain. Yes. So that when you look back on the past, it's not just pain you see, mm -hmm. you can take something from it and shift the meaning of those experiences and make it more useful going forward. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what it's about. And it's about, and now it's, it's, you know, we're in, you know, we're three years in, you know, and it's, we're are at a point where, where things are improving yeah. now, it's not gone anywhere. And, and maybe it is time to start, um, to really begin the process of healing and, and and seeing what we can use to our advantage when moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I think that we are in a period of regrowth. We're we're in this period mm -hmm. where the people that were really 
you know, burned out and needed a change have made that change. And the people that, you know, I mean, I'm speaking in, in generics, obviously, but, but, you know, the, the people that have stayed, I think that we're, we're in a period where we are more capable to help this regrowth and rebuild in our, in our units and in our practices in the, in an inpatient setting, I guess, you know, cause that's yeah. where we experienced, I think, you know, most of the trauma, I think from COVID, from the hospital sense as a nurse, I think the, the bulk of it arguably happened inpatient, you know, to our inpatient nur- nurses that were overwhelmed and, and, you know, and I still, and, and trauma really, you know, creeps up on you. I, I think of myself as pretty resilient, but even the other day, I, I, we talked about this briefly, you know, last week, you know, I, I had a situation where I had a COVID patient just briefly. I wasn't the nurse, but I was taking care of them, um, while the other nurse was in a code and, um, I left that room and I had to pause. I had to stop myself because I was, had this overwhelming sense of, you know, undue stress. I was just, you know, I, I was breathing faster. I was like, I have to, cause in my head, I just kept thinking like, I can't go back to taking care of these patients. I can't, I can't go back to, to this situation because I mean, that patient was, it took, transported me right back. He was very, very mm-hmm. sick with COVID and, and ended up being intubated and, and ended up passing away. Um, but so it just really, you know, it, that, trauma is still there, you know, that, that those feelings and everything. And, you know, we have to be able to, we have to have a toolbox of, of things that we can use to, to process those things. Absolutely. And that's, and that's really a lot of the work that I do is that these really painful experiences that we, we have acquired because we acquire a lot of them during our lifetime. They're not going anywhere. I mean, just Mm -hmm. from an evolutionary standpoint, our brain won't let us forget those painful experiences because it wants to remember so we can be on guard for similar dangers Mm -hmm. in the future. And just so, so they're not going anywhere. And so even, so that's part of why we, it's important to start shifting our story because those memories are going to be there. There's going to be times where we're sent back and, how can you handle those times when you get sent back so you don't stay there? Yeah. I mean, you know, with me having PTSD, I, I know that like there are, I can see huge periods of growth and huge examples of growth in me because previously when I used to think about memories from my trauma, I would be like hit with depression for days or weeks after, mm. whereas now they can revisit and they might sideline me for a few minutes. And if they're really bad, maybe a few hours, but they don't put me down yeah. permanently. And it's like, and that's what the building our, you know, arsenal of tools is about is how do you handle, um, not only the past pain that keeps creeping, creeping in, but just the way you're going to continue to be bombarded the longer you exist with more pain, because that's the world we live in. And it is filled with these painful experiences. So how do you deal with the past pain, Yeah, you know, present pain and worries about your future? Yeah, that is a great point. You know, the, the memories are never going to go away. It's a, it's a matter of how you're going to deal with those, those things. Very true. So yeah. the way that I'd like to set up this episode, I read your book, I, uh, your first book, Transformation After Trauma, mm-hmm. Embracing Post-Traumatic Growth. And I was hoping maybe we could go through some of those tools that you highlight in your book that cultivate growth after traumatic experiences, you know, why they work. And then maybe together, because I know you're not a clinician, but I'm a clinician. Mm-hmm. So maybe we can tie them mm-hmm. in to how they could be implemented into the nurse's lifestyle in particular. And it's important to try and tailor this episode for me, you know, to nurses, because I think that's, yes. you know, y- you, uh, there, there are certain tools that you think like, oh, I could, you know, that, that doesn't apply to me. But I think that it certainly can, you know, if we, yeah. if we tailor it that way. Of course. Yes. I'd love to talk, you know, because that's people, some people were surprised by the book that it, you know, it was talking about embracing post-traumatic growth. And yet I focused almost entirely on self-care tools, but that's the only way, like, how can you ever really 
grow from an experience if if you're barely surviving. I mean, the only way you yeah. can, you, you have to get out of survival mode and you have to build a handle, you know, new stressors coming in. And the only way you can do that is through self-care, self-care. And one, this one tool may not always work yeah. for every single kind of stressor. So it's important to have, a, and what may work for one person may not work for another. And what may work at one point in your life may not work at another. So it's important to just have a variety of options to turn to when, when we're getting stuck. Yeah. Well, and yeah. I think, I mean, self-care is such an umbrella term, you know, there's so many different tools within that, within that, yes. you know, scope. And like when people think of self-care, they think of getting their nails done or a massage. And it's like, that's, you know, that's one of them. But like, course, that's yeah. not, you know, there's so much more that we can delve into in, in different avenues. So, and in looking at some of these tools, you know, you say in the beginning of the book, these tools are things that you can do independently, you know, aside from therapy and medication. You talk about the importance of being able to ease the pain, you know, yourself. And being in control of that as opposed to, you know, these other like, you know, obviously medications and therapy are, are totally, you know, useful and, and especially, you know, it, I love therapy. I've been to therapy so yeah. many times. I think everybody should be in therapy. Yeah. But I think it's also, you know, so integral to highlight these ways that you can, you know, control your progression and your transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because somebody is not always going to be there for you. Like the therapist can't, can't be with you every single minute and medicine can be really great to help, but it's not a cure all. Like it doesn't, doesn't take away anxiety completely. It doesn't take away depression completely it, these issues. Yeah. So it's like, you need to have mechanisms. So some people, you know, think that I'm, I'm saying that medicine and therapy aren't useful. No, actually they're very useful, but to an extent, there is an immense Mm -hmm. amount of work that you need to be able to do on your own to get these things out of control so you don't turn to negative coping strategies like drinking alcohol and using drugs and food and sex and all these things. So it's because that's what people don't realize is when they're turning to these things, mm -hmm. getting immersed in social media and TV and all these other things, they're, they are using them as a coping strategy because they don't have other tools to use instead. Right. Um, and so, and that's really what I encourage people to do is start taking inventory of like, what are you doing now to cope with things that are really difficult? And is that working yeah. for you? Is it really serving you? Or is there maybe a way we can tweak that and modify it and add in some new things or just you know, just little things, little shifts to change how you're experiencing life. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things that you, that you talk about is goal setting. So why mm -hmm. is goal setting important after trauma and how did it help you? Yeah. And, and this is another thing people are like, why does she focus so much on goal setting? My, my second book is entirely on, on the power of goal setting after trauma. It's, it's, it is that important to me because trauma traps us in the past. It gets us stuck. And, and of course, like how stuck you get is depends on a variety of factors. It depends on the traumatic experience in, it's, in itself. You know, was it one time? Was it many times? And, you know, what were your past experiences before that? And what were your coping mechanisms at the time? So like, you know, everybody's trauma is different. Um, but what happens though, is when you do experience trauma, it does make you stuck. And sometimes you get just stuck in certain th thought patterns that are negative and mm -hmm. not useful. Sometimes you get stuck in unresourceful states like depression and anxiety and worry and hopelessness and anger. And so in order, so you've got to start getting some distance between those painful experiences in this new way of life that mm. you want to experience. And so to get there though, you first have to want to experience life differently. I must say that. Like some people will say, how can I help so-and-so? I'm, I've tried everything and they just, they're not changing. They don't want to be helped. And that's part of the issue is some people aren't ready. 
Mm-hmm. to change some pe- some people it is serving them in some way to be in this state where you know um from the outside it looks like it's not serving them very well but for them it's useful to them but mm-hmm. once you get to that point where you're able to say what i'm doing right now is not working I want to experience life differently or you know let's take it from a nursing perspective I want to keep practicing nursing but I don't know how I'm going to keep doing that. I want to keep working Mm -hmm. at this facility. I don't know how I can keep going in there. Could reply to your relationships. I want to stay in this marriage, but I don't know, you know, Mm -hmm. like how I'm going to make that work. And so you have to first say, I want to experience life differently. And then, then it's like, okay, how do I want, what, what does that look like? And so this is where goal setting comes in, where you Mm -hmm. have to say, I do want to experience life differently. And goal setting is about just seeing that you want something more than you have right now. Mm -hmm. And, and that's all it is, is recognizing you want more than what you have. Yeah. And that is such a big step for people who are, are just are suffering. And sometimes, you know, people think suffering has to be like, they're not functioning and aren't capable of working. No, I know a lot of people that are just able to muscle through and they can go into work each day, but they're not happy. They're really miserable. They're just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. And so being able to recognize that you want to experience life differently and then being able to stop and say, how am I going to get there? And that's the big step. The how is like the big step, but being able to recognize, I want to experience it differently. And then it's about figuring out how can you, how can you just start taking little bitty steps Mm -hmm. each day to make those incremental changes because that's a lot where a lot of people get stuck. They say, I want to change, but I have absolutely no idea where to begin. Yeah. And it's, you have to start small, these, you know, little goals. It could be, you know, I just want to get out of work on time. You know, like that's, that's something that, right? you know, I, I deal with that all the time. You know, you, you it's so hard to get out at seven 30, you know, even you've been there for 12 hours, but a lot happens between seven and seven 30. And, you know, how are you going to be able to get home? And that's one of my biggest things too. I, I hate leaving late because I feel like this place has taken so much from me in the 12 and a half hours I was here. And I just want to go home. Like I have to see my baby. So like, you know, I, that's a goal. That's a good goal for me. Like, you know, I just, I need to get out on time. That's a boundary that I need to set, mm-hmm. you know, in order to, in order to have a healthy, you know, work relationship, like yeah. get out of work on time. Yeah. And, and that's, it's a wonderful goal. And most people don't see that that is a boundary. Uh, that's, yeah. and you know, like at NurseCon, that's the other program we did was on boundary setting. Cause a lot of people don't realize the ways that they give their life away to other people mm-hmm. and organizations. And that's part of why a lot of people are so dissatisfied with their life because they are giving their life to other people and having other people in their jobs determine what their days are going to look like. Mm-hmm. And part Part, one part of really determining like and really controlling our life is determining like really setting boundaries and say, no, this is my schedule. And yes, once in a while things may come up, but work's going to take as much as they can from yeah. us. And so, so you've got to set a line. And then if you say, okay, my goal is to get out on time and it's not happening, well, what are the things impeding right. that? Yeah. And how can you start shipping away one at a time at the little obstacles impeding your success? Yeah. Because, um, and so achieving the goal may not happen overnight, but you can start shipping away at the obstacles in the path. Yeah. Cause yeah. it's not just, you know, saying to the person right. that you're giving report right. from like, Hey, I have a hard stop at seven 30. I need to go. Yeah. It's like, what, could I have done at 6 a.m. to, you know, like, what could I start delegating at 6 a.m. in order to, or, you know, how can I intentionally, you know, delegate an extra amount in order to get my stuff done, you know, so to make sure that I'm caught up, like, there's pieces that you have to, you know, back up a little bit and figure out what you're doing in your day in order to, to achieve that goal. 
Absolutely. And that's where it really, um, I would say, I wouldn't hesitate to say that the majority of people are very reactive in their own life. They're just reacting to the world. The world is giving them, it, you know, throwing experiences and stimulus and all these things and obstacles in their way. And they're just reacting. The majority of people aren't proactive in how they approach life and really think, okay, like you're saying, like, okay, I have this goal to get done. What, and, and have some foresight, like, I have done these, I have worked here for this long. I know these are the kinds of obstacles I can mm -hmm. face during the day. What can I do to start, you know, trying to mitigate them early in the day? Who do I need to talk to? What do I need to delegate? What do I need to let go of, you know, as far as, you know, whatever it is, yeah. you guys, you know, yeah. people have Get your charting their... done yes, earlier in the course. shift, you know, I'm trying to think of other things that I could, <laughs> this is very <laughs> applicable to me. This, I this know, episode is really, so to, Stephanie can, can help me. My day. <laughs> no, <laughs> but as an example, I'm just trying to think of other things that I could, you know, potentially do because you're so right. Like, you know, the workflow of right. wh what's right. going to go on in the shift and what's going to trip you up. So be intentional about identifying those things in order to keep, you know, to, to achieve your goal. Another thing I thought when a, like if you are you feel like you just need to get, you know, move your body, like make a goal to get off the unit once a shift or something. Just, you know, separate yourself a little bit and like go on a walk or you know, do the stairs, something like, you know, if if you feel sometimes I think in shifts I get so enveloped in what's going on in the day with the patient and you just kind of have to separate yourself a little bit from that and be mm -hmm. like what am I having for dinner tonight you know just like <laughs> I need to to bring actual life back in and so you know if you know, a goal could be to like maybe have that little you know moment once a shift like to like pull you back into real life because like you said, I mean, there's, we're receptive to everything you're, you're giving so much in this profession and mm -hmm. it's so easy to get sucked into people's, you know, situations. And mm -hmm. sometimes I don't think about, I don't look at my phone for 12 hours because I'm just right. invested in, you know, what's going on. And it takes so yeah. it takes so much out of you doing yeah. that. Yeah. You know, and I, I just have to say that some people are okay with this, like, I just want to acknowledge this. Some people, you know, are okay with having, because it may be their home life that's chaotic. It may be what's going on in their mind yeah. that is chaotic. And those straight, like not paying attention to any other portion of life may be exactly what they need. And so I just want to acknowledge yeah. that there are some people, they like the, those 12 hour shifts and they want to be able to get home and be so thoroughly exhausted that they don't, you know, have to think about anything else. Mm -hmm. And now, and so, but I don't want to project that that's wrong because some people have, they have really heavy stuff that they're trying to run away from a really heavy stuff in their homes. Like I have some people in my life right now that they have dealing with significant mental illness in the household mm. and that they can't at this point just walk away from and they're trying to figure out how to manage. And, and so it's, it's also, you know, for the listeners, I think important to know that when we're talking about tools and goal setting, that we're not projecting ideals onto anybody sure. yeah, that, absolutely. right. That, that what is what one person may want as their ideal doesn't mean that someone else's. Mm -hmm. ideal. It's about really taking time to determine, are you experiencing life on your terms right now? Mm -hmm. And if not, what can you do to start claiming back bits of your life for yourself and not just giving it all away? Mm -hmm. And so, so if you recognize that you want part of your 12 hour shift for you, which of course is great. If you say, I want that some that 12 hours for me, how do you start carving out those pieces of the day? Mm -hmm. Um, and then just really determining what is important to me and not having the rest of the world say, this should be your goal. <laughs> you yeah. know, like you, this should be your goal. Yeah. 
you know, so, but just, I think that's probably an even, I think a lot of people don't sit long enough to determine even what they want. Yeah. You know? And so like, I think it's great that you've already determined. Yeah. I, I want to get home on time. I want to take time for myself during the 12 hour shift because that's more reflection than the average human being even spends on themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And um, I think also a uh, important distinction too, is to make sure that these goals are for you and not yes. for other people, you know, cause it's so, yeah. you know, it, yeah. we're trying to, again, pull ourselves back into this, you know, independence of how am I fixing what things that can I do in my body to fix the externals, you know, how I respond to things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that is, you know, because we all have different levels of capacity for dealing with stress and what may be stressful to one person may not be stressful to another even, you know, so as you're, you're listening as people are listening to this episode and we're talking about certain stressors, those stressors may not resonate with everyone, but I encourage everyone to think what is a stressor though, that does, you know, specifically apply to you Mm -hmm. and, and what are things that you can start doing? And maybe things we'll talk about today will allow you to start adapting it to your individual. Mm -hmm scenario. And I think that's, that's what conversations like this are about to give people ideas on like, how could they think differently about how they're experiencing life? How could they approach different things differently and, or things differently? And, um, just about brainstorm, we're in a brainstorming stage yeah. here. You know? <laughs> yeah. One thing that I thought was great that you added in your book about this section was, you know, keeping yourself you know, taking note of when you completed certain things or like you know, collecting evidence as tangible proof that, you know, you're amazing and you, you, you know, were completing this thing. And, um, you know, I thought that that was so important. Like if you have little, you know, collect like warm fuzzies, like I was, uh, I love the word warm fuzzy, but I think I have a, I have a folder in my email of warm fuzzies where, you know, things, nice things that people sent or just like, Mm -hmm. you know, like great things that the unit has done. Like I'll I'll put them in this folder, you know, collecting little thank you notes and stuff. It's, it's nice to look back on those things and know that, you know, you're achieving certain, you know, goals and just to be, you know, feeling good that you accomplished something. Yeah, because this world, I mean, it does bring a lot to bear on us. I mean, it's just, we get thrown a lot of heavy stuff. And a lot of times the heavy stuff that's thrown at us is coming because of the heavy stuff they're carrying. You know, most people have a lot of baggage they're carrying around and have not properly processed it. And humans Mm -hmm. are great at passing their pain along to others. And so when somebody else is short or rude or whatever it is, is with you, they're projecting their pain onto you. And, and the, this is why we just have cycles of trauma. And most of our, most humans have, or will experience trauma at some point by the hands or word or actions of others, mm-hmm. humans. Mm-hmm. And, and so because we are, we are experience all the time, so much negativity, um, it is important to have ways to combat that. Yeah. And so this collecting of evidence that, that you're good, that the world is good, that your job is good, whatever it may be, that Mm -hmm. your home is good, whatever these, especially pieces of your life that you're struggling with the most, it's important to start looking for evidence of what's working. And, and I'll have to say, we tend, you know, there's, um, Reverend T.D. Jakes, I just love him. I don't know if you listen to him. He's very powerful, powerful voice and uplifting. And But there's one thing that I, I love that one of his um, sermons he does, um, he says, you will never be defeated by what they say about you. Mm. You will be defeated by what you say about you. Yeah, that's so true. And, yeah. And and the reality is, is yes, yeah, somebody else may have started the story of negativity. Like we may have a story of what's not good about us. And yes, that may have started, that may have been given to us in the past by another human being. 
But we solidify and anchor that story in us Mm -hmm. by the things we repeat and say towards ourselves that are not helpful or useful. So being able to create an all, one of the tools you can add to your arsenal is a list of things that are, are good. And so, yeah, so I collect when somebody sends me a text message or an email or even like on a social media post, they may write like a beautiful comment, really encouraging, uplifting. I screenshot it and I save it to my phone and I have, or even like memes or funny videos I have in my phone. I have one folder called laugh and another one for smile. And I put in there based on the kind of feeling I'm wanting to elicit. I, I have those in there. So if I'm never ever needing a pick me up, I add it in there and And other people I encourage to write it down, like at the end of the day, write down what are some good things people said about you today or that you did that you're really proud of today, even if nobody else noticed, just collecting the good, you know? I really love that. I really, I love the thought of screenshotting text messages that make you feel good and putting them in a folder. I've never thought of doing that. Yeah, like, yeah you know. it's really, I have a whole bunch. And I mean, I don't know, people have different kinds of phones, but like they back it up. So like on Google, for example, like, you know, I get it not on my phone and, and then I can have it on my computer and I can always, yeah. always have it. And I used to, before technology just had a special little box where I'd print it out and put it in there and just ran randomly on a hard day would just pull things out. Um, and, and with my students, like, uh, I use, I always collected, uh, thank you, um, cards and things. And then a hard day at, at, when I was teaching, I'd go through and I'd start reading the good things that reminded me why I was doing this, yeah. you know? So like in, in nursing, for example, you may, we know that the patients themselves and the families may be really difficult to deal with. And well, how can you remember the patients that did touch you and their families that did touch you in a positive way, yeah. you know, that built you up instead of trying to tear you down because of the pain they were in. Yes. You know? Oh, um, I love that. I love that. <laughs> so the next one that I wanted to talk about, I wanted to go through um, identifying bad habits that you replace. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the habits that you kicked and how do you feel like it affected your growth? Yeah. So I, um, I tend to be very open and vulnerable with people. So I, I, because my trauma started as a child, I did develop, um, uh, some very, um, uh, some very unhealthy coping strategies. Um, I developed as a teenager, a very severe eating disorder. And, um, and then I was very promiscuous. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I would regularly like, especially when I was younger drink until I would black out and experiment with all sorts of drugs. Like just didn't, I just didn't care. I just didn't yeah. care about, um, my body. I didn't care about my life. I didn't, you know, all these things. It was a really, it was a really hard place. And, and even though some of these, these really bad habits, um, you know, I engaged in them, you know, two decades or or more ago, there's still remnants of them left Mm -hmm. behind that, that part of me, that self-hatred that allowed me to sleep with random strangers and allowed me to binge and purge, you know, up to 12 times a day. And the part of me that would drink until I blocked out that part of me that hated myself so much, that person's still in there. They're, they're smaller Mm -hmm. than they were before, but they're there. (laughs) So it's, you know, and, and when life is hard, I still want to, like, I say food is my one great love and my preferred form of self-destruction. You know, mm-hmm. like I use it <laughs> to celebrate. I use it, <laughs> you know, like I just, I use it and I use it when I'm really upset. I use it for all sorts of things. And so, so I'll have to say that some of these bad habits that I've made a tremendous amount of improvement with them, but they still, they still hang on. And so I'd like to say that, you know, and this is something I get very upset with that the way that we are shamed for the way that we cope, Mm. we are shamed for using alcohol. We are shamed 
for you know using drugs we're shamed if we get overly you know we gain too much weight we're shamed if we're mm. you know have sex you know with too many people like we're shamed but people don't realize we're doing these things because we're trying to survive and one yeah. thing that i i really get upset with people is they they push this idea that it, you should just stop you know, because mm. drinking alcohol is bad for you, you should just stop because eating until you feel like your stomach's going to explode is bad for you. You should stop. But it just doesn't work like that. Yeah. I mean, the reality is, is that every thought, behavior, habit we have, we have because it served us in some way. Mm -hmm. So drinking alcohol, using drugs, having sex, you know, over exercise, overworking, all of these things, even though they may harm us in some way, we keep doing it because it's worked mm -hmm. in some way. So because it's worked, we can't just stop. Yeah. And that's the first thing I want to make sure people understand is because I get people all the time that are so hard on themselves because they can't kick a bad habit mm -hmm. or that they kicked it for a while and it came back. And I'm hard on myself sometimes for that. But the reality is we started it, the habit, because it worked in some way. We kept it because it worked some way and we revert to it sometimes because it used to work and yeah. it's a known quantity. And so that's the first thing. If you understand that you have habits that you would like to re, you know, no longer have anymore. It's not about just cold turkey stopping mm -hmm. them. It's not so easy, like sheer willpower. You will never be successful because if you do that without really like you're, some people think that they automatically just stop things, but not realizing they always end up replacing it mm -hmm. with something else. We always have mm -hmm. to replace a bad habit. It's not about just stopping it. And so I really encourage people to be purposeful in what they're replacing their habits with. It's like, you know, some people will um, stop smoking, but then they end up with a sugar addiction. Yeah. You know, they're just trading one habit for another. And so knowing that you're turning. So if you say, okay, I want to stop and this is what I had to do. Like I had to say, um, so I had a point where, um, I lost my significant other, just things were really terrible. Um, I got to a point where I couldn't work. My depression was so bad. Um, and I just, I put on weight very rapidly. I mean, I was just spiraling down mm -hmm. and just so many things were going wrong. So I, the most important thing was I couldn't change all of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So like the first thing I'll say to people is that if you have a habit that you want to change, there's likely more than one, <laughs> you know, that you want to work yeah. on and picking one, one to work on. And that's what I did. I, I knew that, um, food was too big for me. You know, mm -hmm. like at that point I was not even 30 years old yet and was morbidly obese. I had high cholesterol and sleep apnea. And my doctor was like, you have to get the weight down. But I knew at that point, I just couldn't stop the eating because it was just too much of a safety net for me. Mm -hmm. At that point, I wasn't ready to give up sleeping with strange men. I just wasn't ready. And again, people may not agree. I just couldn't. I knew at that point I couldn't. Sure. So I said, what is something that I can do that will make improvements in these areas of my life, but, you know, not be so heavy, not be so big. So, so I chunked it up and mm -hmm. I knew that the first thing that I could do was start walking. Mm -hmm. I may not be able yeah. to change what I'm eating right now, but I can change my level of activity. Cause at that point I wasn't doing ec any exercise. So I said, okay, I know my health is an issue what is one facet I can target? So I started committing to walking. Mm -hmm. And so I would set goals for myself. I'd say, okay, Stephanie, you're going to walk at least 10 minutes today. You're going to walk at least 15 minutes today, whatever it is. And I work up to it until I had a habit. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is that once you start doing something that's good for yourself, <laughs> like good for you, you're going to start feeling better. <laughs> so <laughs> when you start feeling better, you're going to feel more resourceful. You're going to yeah. feel more optimistic, more hopeful. And that's what happened to me 
as I started to feel better, I was able to start doing things like cleaning my home and taking care of my body in other respects. And so I was able to slowly start changing how I ate because I was excited about how my body was feeling stronger. And so I started eating a little better, didn't change it overnight, yeah. but I started making incremental improvements. And then as I started to feel better in my body and I just started feeling more hopeful about my future, then I didn't need a man to be able to then prove myself yeah. worth. So everything started to snowball, yeah, snowball, of course. And so, and so that's what I encourage people. You don't have to do everything at one t- at once. You don't have to do it all at once. You pick one area of your life to work on first and then one small facet yeah. of your life. And that's it. Not even the whole area. So if your health is suffering, you know, you need to change your sleep, your exercise, your diet, mm. your emotional health, please do not try to do them all at once. Yeah. Like pick one that's going to be workable. Yeah. And as you start making improvements, the others will fall in line. Yeah. And, and that, that has always been the chunking down the goal, the steps is, is, always been the most critical component so that I didn't over- get overwhelmed yeah. with the process. It was always manageable for me to do it. And people think that everything's going to take so long, but the yeah. reality is like, you didn't get this bad habit overnight. You know, you didn't get into this scenario at work or your relationships or health. You didn't get into it overnight. So it's not going to change yeah. overnight. And so it's just little, little steps and then it'll start compounding Yeah, and you'll have like get momentum and huge changes will start happening over time. Yeah, Yeah. it is the gradual. I feel like that's, I used to do Noom. I don't know if you've heard of Noom. It's like a, it's a, it's a, yes, it's like a weight loss. This is the app. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought so. I thought it was an app. Okay. Yeah. And they talk a lot about how these like tiny little, tiny little Mm -hmm. changes, you know, not, not doing, you know, fad diets, but just kind of you know, wanting to lose like half a pound a week or, or just right. changing your, pers- your perception of why you eat the way you do instead of actually changing what you're eating. Like there's, you know, just tiny little changes in your yeah. thinking and eventually that will, you know, become you eating healthier. Of course. And sometimes it's just about becoming aware what is driving you to eat something? Like, I'm going to tell you, like this past year of my life, I've experienced some very significant stressors and some of my old uh, bad eating patterns have crept back Mm -hmm. in. And there's times that I may, I may drive and go get a cupcake to eat. And I know it's not good for me, but I will name it. I will name it and say, this is what's going on. Mm-hmm. I know it's only a temporary fix, but it's the best I can do yeah. right now. And and sometimes that just not doing it mindlessly, like yeah. actually starting to be mindful of what is driving your decisions. And sometimes that's the biggest thing because sometimes you're able to say, like I'm able to say, oh, I want to go to the store and get something sweet, but I'm able to say it's because this person just really ticked me off. Mm -hmm. And then I get mad and say, I'm not going to give them more power and allow them to harm me in that way. So sometimes just naming it out loud about what's driving you to do something can help tremendously. Yeah. I want to tie this back into specifically some stressors and bad habits that nurses might have and how we can really you know, identify those things and because it is so important to be self-aware when something's not serving you, you know? And so it's one thing that I found myself the other day. So I used to have severe anxiety when it came to work and I changed a lot of things. I ended up traveling and, and I think that that was a, a big change, a good change for me, um, in regards to my anxiety before work, but I used to have a ton of anxiety before work. I couldn't sleep, you know, I would cry before work. I had, I would take like melatonin and Benadryl and NyQuil just to go to sleep. And then I was just counting the minutes down. And, um, I was thinking about, I was particularly anxious the other day before I went into work. And normally now I I don't really, I don't, I definitely don't get as anxious as I used to, but 
I was particularly anxious and I'm like looking at the pot of coffee that I just made and I was like, this is going to make me way more anxious <laughs> if I drink this. And so then I, I poured the whole cup of, I poured the whole pot out and I switched with decaf because I was like, I'm going to be, this is going to make me so much worse than I already am. Yeah. You know, just like I and I was proud of myself for doing that because I don't normally drink decaf. But I thought I the fact that I was like I named that I am anxious right now and I need to, you know, do something about it. And that's like an easy thing that we all can do is just switch, you know, switch to decaf. Yeah. And that's one thing is that it's it's just it doesn't people think that making huge changes in your life have to be hard and it's not. Yeah. I mean, yes, some parts of it may any change we do is uncomfortable. I mean, that's part of being human. I mean, we like we like mm-hmm. there's comfort in 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 just the same. Even if it's not good for us, it's comfortable. So so anytime we change anything, we're gonna get uncomfortable and it's gonna be uneasy, but it doesn't need to be hard and burdensome, like overly burdensome yeah. to make changes. And that's is like a terrific insight to stop and say, wait, caffeine's actually going to promote the feeling that I want less of. And so that is the thing, like you have to first determine, okay, I want to be able to find ways to decrease my anxiety. Yeah. Well, what could be making it worse? So it's not only, and I like that you noticed that because some people are always looking to do things that will stop a pattern, but they often don't look at what are they doing that is actually promoting the pattern Mm -hmm. and could cause the pattern to get worse. And again, this takes time to just sit and be and determining like, what are little things that I could do that are, again, are to just change the way I'm experiencing my days? And again, that's, that's a tremendous amount of insight because that you had about yourself, because, you know, especially when people work really long shifts, sometimes they're so beat, like they don't want to even mm-hmm. take time to even think about, they don't want to think about the day. They want it to be done. They want to yeah. go into the next thing, but sometimes, so they'll, they'll do other things, but they don't ever take time to process. Okay. What, what worked, what didn't work? What's Mm -hmm. a small shift I can make tomorrow, next week, you know, coming weeks and days. And, and so that just, just being is, is, is important. Yeah. Yeah. So I encourage any listeners to kind of try to identify some bad habits that they might be, you know, looking at in their days, um, in that way, whether it's, you know, being anxious, drinking too much coffee or, You know, maybe you're hard on yourself about something that happened at work or, Mm -hmm. you know, like negative self-talk. That could be a bad habit for sure, you know. And I catch a lot of people, I am very in tune to like paying attention to the way that people talk to themselves Mm -hmm. and, and noticing like a lot of people put themselves down tremendously. And sometimes they think it's okay because they'll laugh or whatever, but, but noticing those things that are you actually making your existence more difficult because of the way you're talking yeah to yourself well and sometimes i also see this uh, i think this has changed a lot in the nursing profession i've talked um we've had conversations up before where you know there's this like sometimes people can be nasty you know to make themselves look more competent and there is a underlying feeling that they are that they aren't competent and they need to you know there is like negative talk underneath there and Mm -hmm. so maybe you know identifying that that like how you're interacting with other people that that can be a bad habit as well of course and a lot of people don't see that because we it's very easy for us to make observations about how other people are rude and unkind, <laughs> but it's very difficult for us to step back and say, well, how do we exhibit those same <laughs> behaviors? And, and it's not just the rest of the world that passes their pain onto others. We do it too. Mm-hmm. And so even recognizing like we could be having a terrible time at work, but even recognizing what are we doing to contribute to that difficult work environment. And I don't say that anyways to like turn yourself like on yourself and make you like, it's about just becoming aware of what are small shifts like that you could be doing. Like, you know, 
is, is everything that you're doing working or what are the little things that you could do? Like if you changed how you thought about a coworker who's particularly nasty, would that allow you to soften and would that improve your interaction? with one another, you know, like, because there's some people we're not going to change. We can't like, there's a lot of difficult people in this world and yes, they have their own story, but sometimes there's not a thing we can do about changing them. Mm -hmm. The only thing we can do is change how we think about them. But something interesting happens is that when we change how we think about another person, we do tend to approach them differently. Differently. Mm. And when we start to approach somebody differently, they can start, they may not soften with everybody, but they may soften with us. Yeah. (laughs) And so thinking about that, like, what are your difficulties you're having at work? And, and sometimes it's people, I mean, a lot of the stress we encounter at work, any kind of work is because of the stress we experience with other people. Yes. And, and if we can't change them, and that's frustrating, but we can't. So Mm -hmm. what can we do to change how we interact with these difficult people? So it doesn't weigh so much on us. And then we may end up with a nice byproduct that they might become easier to deal with in the future, but we can't bank on that, but it's it's a possible outcome. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That is so applicable to the healthcare setting. I feel like, I mean, you you have just, it's a melting pot of all different, you know, disciplines and, and you Mm -hmm. go through that, you go through that all the time. Okay, there's one more that I want to squeeze in before we end, and it's a big one. So, I mean, hopefully we'll see where we where we go. We'll have to cut ourselves off at some point. But meditation, I want to talk about meditation. And so yeah. how did meditation help you? How did you get started with it? Because I think there are a lot of people that hear the word meditation and they immediately say like, oh, it's too woo-saw. That's not for me. Yeah. You know, so how how do you, how did it help you? Where did you start? And then I kind of want to go into maybe how can we try to like implement that into our work days? Yeah. And, and I'll have to say that meditation is probably one of the most powerful, um, self-care tools that Mm -hmm. we can utilize, but it's also one of the most difficult to implement, particularly in the beginning when you've yeah. never done it. Like I used to be one of those people that I likely said, I can't meditate. I can't, I can't sit still long enough. I can't, my mind doesn't stop going. Mm-hmm. I, I used to be one of those people. And, and it turns out that meditation is, it's been really, really important to me. And, and meditation, see, people don't often understand that meditation is all about bringing yourself to a single point of focus. Okay. So it's about training your brain to always come back to a single point of focus. So during, that's why meditations vary so much because they vary based on their point of focus. Mm -hmm. The point of focus may be your breathing. The point of focus may be a mantra that you're saying. A point of focus may be the environment around you, sounds, sensations, but there's always a point of focus. And the point is, is to always, and people think, well, I can't meditate because my mind always wanders. No, actually that's what the mind does. (laughs) And the point The point of meditation is to train your brain to keep coming back to the point of focus every time it gets off track. And the reality is, is the longer you, well, yes, the longer you practice, can you go longer periods of time without a point, you know, a distraction potentially, but it depends on what's going on in the day. Even if you're very well practiced in meditation, if you have a really stressful day, there's Mm. still things that are going to creep in, but it's about always coming back. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the reason that is so important, and especially in the workplace and especially in high stress workplaces, and is that it's so easy to get caught up in the drama in the stress and start having that take us away. And then we experience a stressful moment in one room with one patient or their family members or or with a medical doctor or another nurse or whatever it Mm -hmm. may be. And we don't keep it 
there. We then start accumulating. We accumulate our stressors. We then bring it into the next room. And then we talk about, did you hear so-and-so? Or do you know what this person said? And then we'd Mm -hmm. accumulate. And then we keep bringing it on. We bring it on. And we just keep accumulating this stuff. and, And we don't come back to anything in particular other than what the world is telling us we should focus on, in this case, the stressor. Mm -hmm. And so like in the workplace, you could decide, okay, what's going to be my point of focus when I get stressed? Because you can practice meditation without sitting in a chair being quiet, okay? And that's what people don't Mm -hmm. understand is that you can, it is very portable. And so you could determine that my point of focus is always going to be the patient in front of me or the person that is in front of me, the person I am Mm. talking to, not what just happened 10 minutes ago, what not what just happened an hour ago, not what happened yesterday, but what happened in this moment. And, and yes, Mm. ideally you would take times to meditate where you sit and are quiet, but it's the same thing. If you sit for one minute, two minutes, five, 10 minutes to focus on your breathing, the same things are going to come in. The stress from 10 minutes ago, the stress from an hour ago, the stress from a day ago, a year ago, it's coming back in when you're quiet. Mm -hmm. And so the point is to say, no, I am choosing to focus on this breathing pattern that I'm doing right now. So I'm going to let the thought come in. It comes in, but I say, no, I got to go back to my point of focus. It's my breath. Yeah, And so that's what meditation is about, is acknowledging the whole world is going to still be in our head and we're carrying that around with us. Our past is coming with us, people and their voices and our voices are coming with us. Mm-hmm. So how do you train your brain to let that go? And, and so and the longer you meditate, so if you start progressing to... I encourage if people have never done it to start with one minute, you know, yeah. two minutes is better, but if two minutes is too much... You start with one and then progress to five and then 10 Um, and really practice. And you can set like the timer on your phone and and you can practice with just um, a focus on your breathing, like focus on what does it feel like to have um, your, your, the air come in and the air go out. What does it feel like in your nose Mm -hmm. and your mouth? What, what does it feel like? You can even make it that simple and then say, okay, for a minute, I'm only going to focus on the sensation of breathing. And if anything comes in, it's going to come in. I can't stop it, but I'm going to go right back to what I'm focusing on, which is my breath. And in that, but when you start training your brain to do that, you're going to be able to do it in other aspects of your life. So when you're in front of a patient or somebody difficult, you're not thinking about all the 10 hundred things that you have to do, you know, right after you're done with them, you don't have to think about, you're not going to hopefully like if the, what you need to make for dinner tonight and what you need to do with the kids later, the husband, whatever it may be, if that creeps in, you say, no, no, this is my point of focus. Yeah. patient in front of me and, and, and just noticing, like, and just setting that intention, like, because I am a yoga instructor, when you're, you're, you're teaching a yoga class, you always typically start with a, an intention, people setting mm-hmm. an intention for mm-hmm. the practice. And I encourage people to set an intention for their day. Yeah. You know, is it an intention? It could be an intention for the morning and an intention for work an intention for whatever it may be and say, okay, And then have that part of that intention be, what am I going to focus on? And it could be your point of focus could be not flying off the handle, Mm -hmm. you know, when somebody, you know, acts in a certain way to you, or it could be not ruminating with yourself and others about stressful things that happened during the day, because the reality is, yes, it's good in some ways to process these things. But a lot of times the saying it over and over and then getting the other people say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, did you know? <laughs> like it's like sometimes it's good to be affirmed that that what you experienced was hard and the other person was wrong. But there also comes a point where it can also make it worse, <laughs> yeah. where it embeds the hard experience. And then that's your main point of focus. And you mm-hmm. could say, OK, I'm going to allow two minutes to talk or five minutes most to talk about something that's really hard and that's it. I've got to let it go and I've got to focus on something else Mm. because there's, uh, you know, 20 other patients I'm going to see over the next few hours and I've got to let that one go. Yeah. And, and I think 
you know, so that is really important. And, and then, um, and I know we're, we're limited on time, but there are certain breathing techniques in particular that you can utilize that can be used on the spot that not just allow you to like change your point of focus to your breathing, but also will change your physiology. So like a lot of people don't realize that most of the world, like we start out as children, as, as belly breathers. Mm -hmm. If you pay attention to babies, their bellies expand when they inhale. Mm -hmm. And, but if you look at most of adults, like 80% of adults are chest breathers. And mm-hmm. if you notice, most people, when they inhale, their chest comes out and not their belly. And, mm-hmm. and the reality is, and forgive me, I did teach anatomy and physiology for many years, so I, I love this stuff. But <laughs> if you remember the diaphragm, nurses. You're preaching to the choir. Yeah, <laughs> I you're know, right. Yeah. You know the diaphragm. I love that you all know the anatomy. <laughs> so the diaphragm, see, when you inhale, it's supposed to contract and drop down. Well, if you don't allow the belly to expand on the inhale, you're not allowing the organs to go anywhere. The diaphragm gets stuck. So a lot of people, when they inhale, they let their chest come out and they push, they tighten their muscles and their abs, but the Mm. diaphragm gets stuck because you're like contracting the muscles and the organs are there. So you're limiting how much oxygen can come in. Whereas if you allow the belly to expand during the inhale, you allow the organs to displace forward and out. And that allows the diaphragm to come down and expand Mm. the lungs further. And that what happens when you contract the diaphragm in that way, and you have to do this consciously, Mm -hmm. you're doing a few things, you are activating the vagus nerve, which was a, is one of the major nerves in the parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest division. Well, it you know, it is antagonistic to the sympathetic nervous system, our fight or flight division. Mm-hmm. So when you start activating that parasympathetic, um, that vagus nerve, which is part of the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, you start telling the brain, you're okay. It can Mm -hmm. calm itself. So when you start that purposely breathing into your belly, so inhaling and allowing your belly to expand on the inhale, you're allowing more oxygen to come into your lungs, but you're also calming your nervous system. And then on the exhale, that's when you contract the belly. When the exhale, you contract your belly. And what you do is you're pushing, taking all those organs and pushing it up against the diaphragm and allowing for maximal exhalation of CO2. So you're getting those toxins out. And I'm telling you within one minute, you can start noticing a difference in how you're feeling of that deep belly breathing. Like even I'll do this in workshops and people will have have like their, their smart watches on that mm-hmm. attack changes in, you know, respiratory rate and heart rate and, and blood pressure. And they can see like in real time, it's yeah. going down and two minutes is better, but this is something you could do. Like if you were in, di- in a, in a room with a difficult patient, difficult coworker, difficult doctor, family member, what a family member, whatever it may be, you can do deep belly breathing and they don't even have to know you're doing it. Yeah. Or just charting, and you know, while you're chart- charting. While you you're for- charting. Oh, yeah. of course. You know, while you're in the bathroom, while you're washing your hands. while You, you can do it many times throughout the day. Yeah. And it is a form of meditation because you are coming. And see, that's why people don't realize meditation doesn't have to be taking 15 to minutes to a half an hour to sitting in a chair cross-legged. Like, mm-hmm. it, yes, that's one version, but there are many portable versions of meditation. Yeah. And one is just focusing on specific breathing yeah. techniques. And, and I'm telling you, if you were to pick one thing that could completely change you know your physiology very quickly it's changing how you're breathing yeah um because it's 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 really it's really important and but it's uncomfortable i will tell people Mm -hmm. that belly breathing takes practice and so i encourage you to sit and like focus on putting a hand or two on the belly 
and practice with allowing your hands, you know, feeling your hands come out on the inhale yeah. and coming back on the exhale and, and just I, practice. I really like the idea of setting an intention as a group for the yes. shift. Like we, yes. we have most units I would think has huddle, you know, like you yeah. in the beginning of the shift, you, you talk about the day and what to expect for the day. And I would just love to see everybody just like collectively, like try to take a deep breath and then just, you know, take 30 seconds to like set an intention for the shift, you know, and just like that could be, you know, we're going to work together as a team or just, you know, to stay in the moment, like when you're in a, you Mm -hmm. know, not let things get to you or, you know, whatever it can be like setting an intention as a group, I think could be so powerful and it just sets up your day, you know, huddles in the beginning of the shift, you know, setting, setting a group intention for the shift. I, I, I don't know. That's what I thought of when you were talking about meditation. And I think in, when you do it as a group, then you can remind each other. So if you're having a difficult time throughout the day, okay, let's let's practice together. Have you done this? Or maybe you need to step away, or you know, you know, and just being there for one another and not, yeah. you know, coming together for the huddle and then acting like you're on your own little islands for the rest of the day. You know, it yeah. it, it all helps unify the group. Yeah. And, and sometimes your intention may need to change throughout the day. Like you may have something very difficult, but I think if you can enlist the help of coworkers, all the better so yeah. that you know that you're, you're not alone and, and there's, there's people to remind you about, okay, how can you get through this? What can be your new point of focus? So you don't ruminate over this for the entire rest of the shift, you mm-hmm. know, like, and, and that's why I think it's a really great idea to develop a culture yeah. of, 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 it's really a culture of self care and being purposeful, you know, mm-hmm. with our days. And, and, and I think that's a, a beautiful idea to start a shift with that huddle and sending an attention and, and just be ready that some people may not, they may think it's very woo woo and they'll be like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what this person is doing, but um, but maybe they'll come around, but I think to unify a group, um, that's very powerful when you don't feel like you're, you're doing this on your own. Um, yeah. 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 Well, they may not even know that it's a, a form of meditation, you know, yes, it, it seems more yes. of like a goal setting thing. And then <laughs> if you do end up, you know, feeling unified as a group, like maybe you can move into like you know, a couple minutes before a shift, like maybe the people that have already clocked in will like get together in a little circle and just, you know, do a breathing exercise for like literally two minutes. You know, it doesn't have to be a long time, but I think that it could totally just, you know, change your perspective before you get into a shift. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then knowing that that can be done throughout the shift, it doesn't, you know, like these kinds of tools are accessible. Yeah. Um, throughout. And I think if you start a day and and then remind people, this can be done at any point, just remind yourself, it doesn't even have to be two minutes. Just take a minute, step outside, you know, head into the bathroom, whatever it is, take that one minute and breathe. And, And just reminding people that these are tools that are accessible to you that are not labor intensive, time intensive. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aww. Well, there are so many different tools and know. we got through three of them and I would, <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that was going to happen because yeah. you're such a wonderful speaker and I'm just so, I'm so happy to have you on. And, and I just wanted to, you know, thank you for, for sharing your story time and time again, and to being so vulnerable to, to the people that, that you share your, your, um, you know, painful experiences with in order to help them you know you you put yourself in a very vulnerable state and but then you make yourself so relatable and accessible to everybody and it really like cultivates a notion that you know she did it so I can do it and you know so I really appreciate that um from you and I loved your book and I I'm gonna read your other the second book as well (laughs) Well, and my third one will be released this year. Very yes. excited. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, Amazing. Very excited. Well, yeah. where can people find you? Plug some of your some of your social media. Yes. And, and we'll plug it in the description Wonderful. box below, too. 
Yeah, thank you. So my website is serotonuslife.com. And so they'll make sure the spelling is in the show notes. <laughs> um, and But I'm also found on platforms like Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and lots of resources available um, for helping you through difficult things that life can throw at us. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. So thank you for having me on. It's been a wonderful experience. And thanks again. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That brings us to the end of the show. Thanks for tuning in to Nursing Uncharted. To learn more about today's episode, make sure to explore the show notes at AmericanMobile.com slash Nursing Uncharted. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a guest. If you're a nurse interested in traveling, visit AmericanMobile.com to explore the largest database of travel nursing jobs in the industry and the amazing benefits that American Mobile has to offer. Also, a special thanks to producer Jonathan Carey, assistant producers Katie Schrauben and Sam McKay, and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. Until next time, take care of yourself.